thank you so much for, for having me here today. I'm so sorry I can't be there in person. I was really looking forward to it, but I decided I would not be the super spreader who takes down <laughs> the interpretability community. Um, and please forgive noises and the rest from around my house. Um, so my, my title, the title of my comments is a plea for inexplicability, but by no means does that mean I'm going to argue against explicability. Of course I'm not. It's, it's vital work that I assume is going to continue to make remarkable progress. I mean, it's um, without question. Um, but I have a sense that we are at a particular spot in our intellectual history, in our cultural history, in which we can undo one of the oldest and most dangerous of, of metaphysics, metaphysical beliefs that we hold. Um, it's a metaphysics of mastery, the metaphysics of control. Um, and we may be able to break its grip now. That metaphysics views the world as existing as a resource for us to use, to abuse, to use up with disastrous effects all around. And the us who gets to do this, of course, uh, has it applies to certain, certain classes of people, starting with elderly white men. Um, Explanations play a really important part in this metaphysics of control because explanations are the proximal means by which we exercise control. And the fact that we can explain the world is an integral part of our claim to legitimacy in doing so, the rightfulness of our doing so. It's not just a blind will to control, but rather a power grab, but rather it's the responsible act of rational creatures. Breaking the grip of this metaphysics to start with means being very explicit in our understanding that explanations are tools, wildly important tools. But explicability is not a property of the universe. I think that we may all agree that the universe does not owe us an explanation, and if it gave us one, like Wittgenstein's lion, we couldn't understand what it says. And here's what for me is the, the point that concerns me the most. With the metaphysics of con control, within that metaphysics, inexplicability looks like a failure. And, and that's an easy conclusion to draw from the urgency and visibility of the cu current drive for explicability. Inex but inexplicability is not a, f a failure. It's a property of the universe. And there's a truth to inexplicability as well. The, the power of the metaphysics of control is demonstrated by the fact that just about every moment of our lived lives refutes it, you know, like Dr. Johnson kicking the rock, but we still hold on to it when we think about our experience. I mean, we can predict within nine minutes when the New Horizons space probe would arrive at Pluto four billion miles away, but we cannot fully predict or explain exactly why those people were in the crosswalk with us this morning and why this evening when we go out to dinner, the eggplant parmesan is sold out. We can't fully explain or control it, and that which we cannot fully or explain, we consign to the category of accidents. Um, accidents are only uh, negative. I mean, when you take a walk on the path uh, this evening, perhaps you'll come across perhaps a leaf that catches your attention and you will be struck by the fact that it is just exactly that leaf that happens to be in exactly that spot. That is also an accident, but it's an accident that reveals something beautiful. So we live in the, the kingdom of accidents um, at the same time as we hold on to the paradigm, the metaphor the metaphysics of mastery of, of, of control. And we do both those things at once because we're a peculiar species. Um, I think this, is, this conflict, which I think Hegel would call contradiction, is one reason we've rushed onto the internet. Um, it felt like a liberation from the apotheosis of the metaphysics of control that was the age of computers, an age that I think we've pretty much entirely left at this point. Um, uh, and we left this age of computers into the wilds of the internet, um, exactly because the internet was a wilds. It's, it's itself a kingdom of accidents. 
You know, in the age of computers, we carefully selected and filtered our data. We, we trimmed it to fit into normalized, regular, regularized records so that the program, programmatic rules that we had invented knew how to operate unambiguously on them. Um, th this, you know, computer logic is relentlessly simple. Um, programming is complex, but its logic tends to be quite simple. Um, and operating on normalized data explains why being programmed became how we describe someone completely under the sway of the metaphysics of control. But now we've been on the internet, you know, for the past couple of decades for longer, and in some ways it's the Hegelian antith antithesis of the age of computers. Um, the internet, in short, it's a chaotic environment in, the, in chaos theory's idea of, of chaos. I mean, it's nonlinear causation in which small events can have outsized uh, effects. Uh, initial conditions account for a lot. The interdependencies are deep, they're dense, and they're mutual. And yet it's that chaos that exactly draws us into the internet, sometimes kicking and screaming about internet's evil effects, but still we spend a lot of time there and we wouldn't know what to do without it. And I dare say that most of us enjoy much of our time there, even if we want to deny it. The internet, in effect, has spent 30 years training us to appreciate the exactly, exactly the sort of insanely complex and chaotic environment that the metaphysics of control has tried to protect us from and I think machine learning may be revealing to us. Um, if the internet has set us up for the transformation that machine learn, learning is enabling, then I, I want to argue that that transformation is epical. Um, for me, it's epitomized by a phrase we hear a lot in the age of machine learning, um, often in voices that are nearing panic. The phrase is, we don't know how it works. And the transformative part of it, for me, is not the negative, we don't know how, but the positive affirmation, it works. That it works is so important because it upsets the West's multi-millennial conviction that knowing how it works is our human essence and our destiny. But while we may not know the specifics of how a model works, if it works, it's because it's uncovered something truthful about the world. And if the model is complex to the point of uninterpretability, it works because the realm it's in is so complex. The it works is teaching us that the most inexplicable of boxes is the world. The world is the black box. It doesn't mean we can never explain anything in the world or in machine learning models. We can because explanations are tools and they're never complete and they're always approximate, but they they get the job done, which is exactly what we want from tools. They get the job done, however, in a universe in which everything affects everything else all the time, everywhere, and forever. Explanations are wonderful tools. At the heart of this is, I think, a change in how we think about the general and the particular. In the West, we've taken principles, laws, uh, generalizations of all sorts, as the higher truth, as the lens through which we see the truth of the chaos of particulars of the world of accidents, the kingdom of accidents. And of course, machine learning doesn't reject all rules and generalizations. I mean, nobody likes overfitting. But machine learning's generalizations don't do what we value traditional generalizations for. We liked traditional rules, principles, and other types of generalizations because we could understand them. But machine learning comes up with generalizations without caring if we understand them, at least at this point. Generalizations were, excuse me, were valuable because of their broad explanatory power, the fact that they apply to many different cases. But machine learning's generalizations may not generalize beyond the model that results from them. We liked traditional generalizations because we could apply them to particulars. They're the, the levers used by the metaphysics of control. But we cannot sometimes anyway, apply, usually can't apply machine uh, learning generalizations without using a model to do it. We can't do it, the model can. And this isn't just a technical nit, nit. Having to use a model to apply the generalizations means that we give up our role as the knower of rules who thereby have legitimacy uh, over the, to rule over, over particulars. In some ways, Machine learning is a triumph of the particular. Um, 
models arise from particulars and may be as inexplicable as those particulars, as inexplicable as anything else in, in the kingdom of accidents. Um, and they may be general, generalizations that apply only to particular situations, the way the solution to a murder mystery is particular to its details. I'm not pretending to know exactly why and what this metaphysical, metaphysical switch may, uh, may, may mean, but let me, let me give you a vague idea of why I think maybe it matters. So first, machine learning is a type of control and mastery, of course. It extends the human grip quite dramatically. But because it can be inexplicable and is always st st <laughs> statistical in its nature, this, and, and this is or can be mastery without the arrogance and, and blinding confidence that knowledge tends to all too often. Second, valorizing particulars may make a difference in our everyday understanding of our everyday experience. But, you know, maybe we'll start to heal the gap between our experience and our interpretation of the experience, uh, experience in the kingdom of accidents. But, but I don't know. Um, but valorizing particulars means valorizing differences, because differences are what make particulars particulars. Um, and valuing differences could have obvious social and political benefits, um, thing, uh, something that we've long been looking for, the valuing of differences. And finally, because you thought I was at the end, but I'm not quite, let me give you one concrete example of how this might apply. So in the West, moral thinking generally is meant applying a moral framework, a deontological or consequentialist or whatever, and you apply that framework to um, particular moral problems and you get your solution. But I think we all recognize at this point it's easier to get agreement about the framework that you accept than about how to apply it. At least that's the takeaway from a heck of a lot of Ethics 101 classes, including ones I used to teach, in which the drill is the professor presents a moral framework, explains it, gives some examples of how it applies, and then once the students are nodding their heads, the professor then gives hypotheticals where it fails, and the students try to make it fit, the professor wins by keeping them confounded, and then moves on to the next framework, and out of it come students are that who are depressed and cynical, or maybe they just become wise guys. Uh, that doesn't stop us from talking about moral issues in real life, of course. But when we do offer moral advice, often uh, most of us will make some reference to our own experience, um, propose something, and then say to our friend, I, I mean, we'll say this, I, I mean, that's, uh, that's how I handle a similar case, but your mileage may vary, or some other idiom, not quite so American maybe, which says, this is what I'm saying has validity, but my case doesn't necessarily generalize. And that last phrase, I think, is a really crucial recognition of the primacy of the particular. I think it's a really good thing to say and to be aware of. And it may be our encounter with machine learning is forcing us to face this type of moral particularity. Because we have to figure out in great detail exactly what objective functions we want to uh, to use, and um, are they good and fair, and, and can we quantify that the way that we do in, <laughs> when using machine learning? And we, uh, we argue about how to adjust the model's tolerances and the trade-offs, very particular. We, we talk about which of the so-called 21 mathematical models of, of ethics, of fairness to apply, and all the rest. And that difficulty is perhaps bringing us to recognize the particularity of moral decisions, and also the failure of the sort of traditional moral generalization that we've relied on. I just want to take a quick second to shout out the ethics of care, a, a, um, a moral framework of a particular type. It goes back 20 to 40 years, depending on how you count, and is rooted in feminist philosophy that does not look to find the moral framework and generalizations, but instead takes as its example of a moral relationship that exemplified by a mother and their children, the most particular of caring relationships. And I, I, I'm seeing more and more people talking about ethics of care, which makes me very happy, frankly. Um, okay, so um, we are in a unique moment, I think, when we can flip the metaphysics of control, of mastery, and this could be a Copernican turning point for us. My concern is that we might miss this opportunity if the public only hears that inexplicability is a failure. 
a problem that we can, should, and will overcome if we just try hard enough. This reinforces the expectation that explanations are owed to us as humans, that explanations are a property of our uni universe. But it, they're not. Inexplicability is not a human failure. It's an essential property of our universe and of our nature as humans. In the metaphor that guided Martin Heidegger, the ground of what we uncover is the vast hiddenness on which we walk. We are, I believe anyway, better, truer people and cultures if we embrace the essential unknowing at the heart of our experience and the hidden that makes explanations possible. Thank you.